Okay, we're gonna move to Judge Gleason, who's batting cleanup today. I could eat up his 15 minutes just with his accomplishments, but I'm gonna do it in 30 seconds. Um, he uh, went to Georgetown, undergrad, University of Virginia Law School, spent many years as a federal prosecutor in uh, Brooklyn. He was the lead prosecutor in the uh, successful conviction of John Gotti. He was appointed to the bench, um, uh, federal bench as a district court judge in Brooklyn, served for 22 years in that capacity. And I will point out for purposes of today's discussion, um, what is, has been a trailblazer in sentencing reform. Judge Gleason was talking about sentencing reform long before anybody else. He helped found a number of alternative to incarceration programs in Brooklyn um, that have now become a model for courts uh, throughout the country. Uh, I find all his work uh, extremely inspirational. Um, and now uh, uh, in 2016, he became a partner at Deva Voice in Plimpton where he now uh, works, but uh, that has allowed him uh, to really uh, do sentencing reform from the outside. As a judge, you have certain constraints on what you can do as a matter of policy, um, uh, but uh, I'm hoping that he'll talk about what his efforts have been uh, since he's left the bench to help advance sentencing reform. So uh, Judge Gleason. Uh, thank you, Judge Joe. You know, he used to be my little brother on the bench in Brooklyn. Now I'm back among the unwashed and he's been elevated to the Court of Appeals. So I have to I treat him like the special- uh, I'm still your little brother. <laughs> thank you, Joe. Um, look, I'm, thank you for having me. It's a great thing that the circuit is doing. Thank you, Larry and Deirdre and Rob and, and all of our participants, Nicole. Um, it's a really good thing you're doing uh, to assist uh, the, our, our audience. Um, look, I've been a, I'm a part of the system. I was a prosecutor for 10 years and a judge for 22. And now I'm, I'm out doing litigation, but I'm doing criminal defense as well. So I've, for five years, and I, I feel like I know I'm a part of the system. Uh, I've had every role in the system, except the one Larry has. Larry, thank you so much for, for providing that perspective. Um, it's so important. I was taught by one of my mentors to visit a prison every year, and I did um, while I was on the bench. So I could, I was told, you go, don't forget, don't forget the defendants you sentence after they go through the marshal's uh, uh, cell block door, go and see where they go after you sentence them. Because Look, and I, the reason I say I'm part of the system is so I, I, I can say not as an outsider, as an insider, it's my system too. But make no mistake about it, it is uniquely punitive. Uh, uniquely, all good criminal justice systems need to be introspective and look for defects. And we got a lot of them. We have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. We criminalize more conduct than any country that we consider similar to ours. We incarcerate people for much longer than they do in circumstances that strip them of their dignity in ways that don't need to. I'm on the board of a nonprofit called Vera Institute of Justice, and we bring corrections leaders from, the, from around the country to places like Germany where people in prison dress like this and they can go out to a job and then come back. It doesn't have to be the way it is. And, you know, look, Larry, you know, he said he saw Black's Law Dictionary and made it, you know, said he thought that was the law for Blacks. And unfortunately, he's closer to the truth, to the truth than he imagined. You know, we, for years, we punished crack cocaine, and for, you know, one gram of crack cocaine, the same way we punished 100 grams of powder cocaine. And then we figured out that was there was no basis for that. And it was shamelessly, shamefully, racially discriminatory. And it took us a quarter century to fix it. And we didn't fix it all the way. We still do it. But now we do it to an 18 to 1 ratio. I've spent the last couple of years trying to ameliorate the effects on individuals of a sentencing enhancement. You know, when you commit a robbery with a gun, a prosecutor has two choices. It can prosecute you for the robbery and then increase your offense level by a couple of levels because you had a gun. 
or it can bring a separate charge that gets you a mandatory consecutive 25 years for that gun. And whereas 46% of the eligible population for the hard, for the, for the 25 year option are black men, the ones who get the 25 year option back to back these uh, and mandatory uh, enhanced sentences are 70% black. So, you know, it's not, uh, it, might, it, it might be implicit and uh, unintended might just be a discriminatory impact, but we, we have a race problem throughout our society. We have one in criminal justice to a degree that is uh, no one should, to, uh, should underestimate. So, you know, if you wanna look from your perspective, you know, I love talking to teachers because, you know, there's so many facets. It seems like an overwhelming issue, criminal justice and criminal justice reform. But it's not hard to focus on, on facets of it, each one of which we could have a program of this length uh, independently. Sorry if my dog starts barking behind me, but if I didn't let him in, he'd be barking at the door now. You know, so there are mandatory minimum sentences. You've heard um, about those mandatory minimum sentences and guidelines. The regime we now have, it's about 35 years old, took sentencing discretion away from prosecutors, away from judges, excuse me, um, because it was previously unbounded and there was a decision made to guide it and, and, and restrict it. And discretion in a system that tries to individualize sentences is kind of like water, you know, it seeks its level. If you take it away from, from judges, it's gonna go somewhere and it went to the executive branch. They can charge mandatory minimum. When I began as a prosecutor in 1985, 20% of cases went to trial. For the last well, more than a decade, fewer than 3% of cases go to trial. Because prosecutors say to someone, if you don't plead or you don't plead guilty and cooperate, you're gonna face an onerous mandatory minimum sentence or an onerous guideline range based on those mandatory minimums. So we have a, We've shifted as a system from an indeterminate regime in which judges were empowered to a determinate one that empowered prosecutors. In that, during that period, there's a 700% explosion in our federal prison population. Um, as I say, a diminution in the trial rate from 20% to 3%, a diminution in the number of sentences that did not involve incarceration from 50% down to what it is now, 7%. And the pendulum is beginning to swing back. It's always that kind of, any change that inures to the benefit of a criminal defendant always comes at a glacial pace because legislators have to run for office. And there's this sense that anything that can be characterized in a soundbite as soft on crime will get you unelected. So even when there is a consensus, and there is, everybody, most people on both sides of the aisle, for whatever reason, of the, of the Democratic Republican aisle, for whatever reason, some, some are driven, some are influenced by the fiscal costs of over-incarceration, some by the human costs of over-incarceration. For whatever reason, there, there is now a consensus that we've over-incarcerated. We need to decarcerate. But even when we reach a consensus, uh, it's getting change is like turning the Queen Mary around when it, the change inures to the benefit of criminal defense. It's coming slowly. We had a, you, some of you may have read about the First Step Act. It's now two years old. That was really literally the First Step Act in reforming the results of the last sentencing reform movement. And there's a lot of work to be done. Other, just quickly, other facets, so there's mandatory minimums, there's harsh guidelines. There's an insufficient number of alternatives to incarceration. Federal system is slightly different, fewer addicts proportionally than in the state systems, but there are plenty of them. And it takes $2,500 a year to treat, but it takes $30,000 a year to incarcerate. 
So thank you, Joe, for mentioning the pretrial, the drug court that we started in Brooklyn that's become a model. It's a sensible alternative to incarceration. So there's insufficient alternatives to incarceration. Rob is now firmly entrenched in the re-entry space. We don't, we incarcerate for too long. There's a direct relationship between the length of incarceration and increased recidivism, not decreased. So we need to give people help to assimilate back into their communities. And that's where re-entry and the re-entry coordinators in the US Attorney's Office play such an important role. And lastly, long after people are finished paying their debt to society through a prison term, if one is imposed, through supervision under Rob's, in, under Rob's tutelage in the Eastern District of New York, there are collateral consequences of convictions that are inestimable. They really, you know, you can't get a job. Sometimes you can't get housing. And we need, as a society, we need to come to grips. You know, and there, it's a patchwork quilt of like senseless, uh, you know, you can't become, you can't get a barber's license in New York if you have a federal conviction. There's any number of imposed federally or state or regulations of impediments. We want people, once they've finished their criminal justice experience, to become productive members of the community, but we erect these, these uh, this mind-numbing uh, array of barriers, not just impeding the right to vote and the ones you've heard about, but ones that keep people from getting jobs and keeping jobs. So look, I love our system. I'm, a, I'm part of it. Sometimes I'm ashamed at the features of it we have now, but it always makes me determined to kind of not just beef about it, but, but in a, in a, like a, the lawyer that I am, describe how we got there, describe why it's wrong, and then the history that associated with how we got there is often the key to how we fix it. And there's a lot of work to be done. So why don't I just stop there, Joe, because I know. I just, I, just in, in a minute, John, I just, I, I find the work you're doing now so inspirational. Could you just describe what you're doing at Deba Voice to uh, try to address people who have gotten some of these long mandatory minimums? Could you just talk for a minute about that? Yes, the most of my typical client, and now I've got about 40 of them, um, committed uh, five or six robberies when they were 19 years old, many of them addicted. And because they had the temerity to exercise their Sixth Amendment right to trial, they were forced to face the uh, multiple gun counts of the kinds I described, of the kind I described earlier. So they're doing life. It, it may be 112 years without parole, not life without parole, but they're gonna die before they serve 112 years. The First Step Act opened up a path to go back before judges like Joe Bianco and for us to, to seek a sentence reduction based on what are what the legal phrase is extraordinary and compelling circumstances. And one extraordinary and compelling circumstance is obviously the length of the sentence, Another is it's a sentence enhancement that was deployed in racially discriminatory fashion by the Department of Justice. Other extraordinary circumstances are, you know, people change. A, a kid who commits a crime at age 19, and any of you with 19 year olds know you haven't grown up. You may be an adult in the eyes of the law, but you're not an adult in any other sense, certainly not your cognitive development. So, and they've, they've grown up. Now that my, a lot of my clients who were 19 when they went in are now 45, 52, whose projected release date is in the next century. And we've gone into court over the virulent objection of the Department of Justice. I don't get that. Sometimes they don't even recognize my Department of Justice. And to seek relief, and we've, we're succeeding around the country. We've already gotten relief. We've got guys home, got about 15 guys home. And there's about 2,500 of these men who were subjected to these stacked firearm enhanced sentences. And uh, I've got a, an associate on each case, young lawyers who are doing, who are getting results for these men. And I, you know, the kind of results that as you can go a whole career as a lawyer and not achieve something as significant as it is to take a man like Larry, who's got a family waiting for him who's doing an excessive sentence 
and getting them home. It's a very, you know, I, I, I've shared this with Deirdre. You know, I spent a lot of years putting people in prison when I was a prosecutor. It's orders of magnitude more difficult, but orders of magnitude more gratifying to get them out when they're serving excessive sentences. And that's what we're doing now. And Judge Gleason has got more people out in the last six months than our whole office. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys could keep, you can compete against each other. That's a good competition, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank fun. Judge. Judge Gleason, uh, despite his unbelievably busy schedule, has always uh, made himself available to speak about uh, sentencing and sentencing reform. And I, I thank him because his insights and his work are second to none. So um, thanks, Judge Gleason.